Hi. Um, so, as you guys know, my name is Jeff, and I'm going to allow my friends here to go ahead and introduce themselves. So, can you just tell me, you know, uh, one minute about who you are and what your project is? Sure. Uh, thanks for the intro, Jeff. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Henry. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so, I'm currently a director, head of global business at Icon. Uh, Icon is one of very few uh, successful Korean blockchain projects mm -hmm. uh, that started uh, in 2016 and actually gained its momentum in 2017. Uh, what Icon is trying to do is to try to tackle the, uh, uh, the interoperability issue of the blockchain industry. So at this point, there are a lot of public blockchains uh, with its own main name, whether it be Ethereum, whether it be a NEM, Quantum, NEO, Icon. But at some point in the future, I think there will be a need for these blockchains to talk to each other, to communicate with each other, to transact with each other. And Icon is trying to build a bridge, a protocol, which allows that to happen in the future. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Henry. And Jan? Hello, everyone. Nice to meet you. My name is Jan. I'm a founder of IT company. We develop cloud software already for six years. And I have 65 employees in-house. And we actually, from a serial sector, we develop uh, software, then launch it, and we have already successfully launched several uh, online online uh, softwares as a e-cloud and marketing cloud. And uh, for the last 11 months, we have been developing our blockchain, blockchain protocol, and a soft and a bunch of softwares of data verification. Yeah, now we are working with the top brands and uh, integrate with the government. And uh, we actually, guys, who you know, we just go to the market, understand what actually market needs. And then we develop just for them, and then we try to make it flexible. So my solution is always not just thinking about a huge, again, a great thing. It's about real integration right now. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. And Joshua from Unity Chain, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? 안녕하십니까. 제 이름은 Joshua Tapunigo. 원래 한국에서 태어났습니다. San Francisco에서 한국으로 돌아와서 듭니다. <laughs> Good, thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Joshua. I'm going to start off uh, maybe with Henry. Um, so basically, we have seen a lot of community grown blockchains. And what I mean by community blo grown blockchains, I, I mean that kind of like NIM. Basically, a bunch of people, friends, partners get together and try to make a blockchain. And it's kind of an organization. Um, I, I think that ICON has a great community here in Korea that's building it. But then we also have blockchain projects that are not necessarily driven by the community, but by big companies. So for instance, Samsung. Samsung is a huge company in Korea, and they're making a project called the Next Ledger. And so we can see that there's kind of two different approaches here in Korea, the Samsung approach, the Icon approach, and we have other big companies around the world, like IBM, for instance, that's getting into blockchain. So I'm curious, what are your thoughts about the big companies versus the community-driven projects and how you've seen those play out? Yeah, I think that's a very good question. So uh, I think it'll be important to kind of give a brief history about where we come from. So when we first started, uh, when we first entered this industry in 2016, we actually started as a, a company that providing blockchain technologies to enterprises in Korea. So we come from a private blockchain industry and our engineers has been uh, looking at different blockchain solutions, private blockchain solutions, uh, such as Hyperledger. So just like Samsung, we initially thought about using Hyperledger fork uh, from Hyperledger to build our blockchain that we're going to provide to provide to enterprises in Korea. But then we actually decided that the Hyperledger actually has a lot of limitations and it's very difficult to change the core of Hyperledgers uh, when we're trying to provide to the Korean enterprises because they had their own specific requirements and standards. So we built our own blockchain technologies uh, and been providing that blockchain solutions to private companies in Korea, including uh, a lot of the securities firms in Korea, uh, a lot of the insurance companies, hospitals. And then at some point, we've kind of reached an epiphany that uh, these private blockchains, when they talk to each other, uh, they could bring uh, unbound business opportunities. Uh, so then the ICON project came. ICON project basically acting as a help blockchain 
for these private or public blockchains to talk to each other. So to answer your question, I guess, uh, I think it's very important to kind of narrow the gap between those two different standards and two different approaches uh, in using blockchain technologies. So on the private blockchain side, uh, what they often claim about public blockchain is that you're not scalable, you're too slow, your throughput is you know, substandard, and that you have no standards for real life applications. Uh, but then on the public blockchain side, they often look at the private blockchains and say that you know, private blockchain is not decentralized, is distributed at best, and that you're not adding any innovations to this industry. Uh, so there's very much a conflict of, uh, conflict of different approaches uh, from companies like IBM, Microsoft, Samsung, and companies like NEM, Icon, and Ethereum. Uh, so I think people are trying to, uh, people are starting to realize that there could be a lot of potential when these two different views of, about this technology converges. And I think the convergence is actually happening at this point. Uh, so from Icon's perspective, we're working with uh, a lot of enterprises. Uh, the most recent partnership that we made uh, that I think is very interesting is our Icon's partnership with Line. Uh, I think Korean, many Korean people would know where Line come from and what services they provide. And what Line and Icon is trying to do is not let Line build their services on top of Icon, but use the same engine as what Icon is using and then trying to build their services. And what Icon is simply trying to do with Line is to provide the technology and, the pro and also to provide the protocols that allows Line services that build on top of Line blockchain to talk to different blockchains, let's say for NEM. That's good, yeah, yeah. I like that. Um, Jan, he, he was just talking about private and public protocols. Sometimes we have private, sometimes we have public. And he, as he mentioned, he said that the public blockchains always tell the private blockchains you're not secure, and the private blockchains are always telling the public blockchains you don't scale. Um, NIM's approach at that time was to basically make hybrid blockchains um, to kind of try to do the best of both. But can you tell me your thoughts about uh, blockchains private versus public, where you think there's security, scalability, how you think you see that playing out? Yeah. And I also wanted to mention that the previous question was a very good one. Mm. And uh, okay. it's two things. First one is a community. And if you have a community, it's always easy to promote. It's all easy to integrate. It is easy to build a community of developers who will make a lot of new applications which you even didn't think about. And each of the applications can make a new pivot for your your blockchain protocol, and it's very nice. And it's also, you know, a romantic, romantic idea that, like, if we are a community, we can create our own blockchain solution, and our community can be a power. Our community can be something which can change the rules of the game. And it's such a big and great romantic feeling that uh, it, it can actually make a lot of new things in the world. But the world is not so romantic, and uh, there are a lot of companies who, who are already playing their role in, uh, in, in, this, in, this, in this world. And uh, such companies as IBM and uh, Samsung and different, they are already made a lot. And uh, if IBM, for example, launched this product or this kind of protocol or anything, many companies instantly adopt this technology and uh, do it immediately because they trust ABM and uh, they already for a long time with them. And uh, so it has to be uh, also uh, public, public blockchains and private blockchains. It also has to be community-driven blockchains and uh, big, huge corporations uh, uh, blockchains. So for example, in Endo, we use, uh, we use our own solution, our own blockchain, and we also use EOS and we also use Hyperledger, because I understand if I want to make business, real business, not just you know develop some kind of a blockchain and then show everyone on the conference or anywhere, and uh, if I want to d d implement it in a real companies, I have to do something which is really easy to adopt. For example, Name is really easy to adopt, uh, our solution also, and Hyperledger is for big companies. So 
you, if you want to make a real business with companies, you have to respect all the technologies and do all the stuff uh, together. So, yeah, it's uh, you have to you have to you have to use Hyperledger 100% because uh, it is from IBM and IBM is the uh, number number one in uh, corporate enterprise solutions. And uh, for scalability, uh, you know, my my point is my favorite, okay, it's, it's, it is off chains and multiple chains and different uh, different approaches of the scalability. But my favorite one is uh, uh, creating a better consensus or actually using a better consensus in the right place. For example, somewhere when there is no trust at all and everyone wants to cheat and uh, it is better to use, I don't know, proof of work solution is like the best one, even the slow, expensive and everything. But if it's, if it is some, for example, government stuff and government can create and issue, for example, certificates or documents, perhaps they can use, for example, depots, consensus or something else. But uh, it could be much faster, easier, and uh, not so expensive because we actually trust government. So, uh, because yeah, it's, it's a romantic, a romantic know that GPOS is way better for government oh, for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah but it, it, it you know there a lot of guys who okay we are blockchain guys we will crash government we will change the government actually no government helps us to not to kill everybody it's uh, have some kind of a rules so now and in 5 and 10 and 20 years we actually trust and respect government so if government use for example deep post consensus it would be much better than <laughs> making a proof of work consensus for for the government so we have to use the right consensus uh, solution in the right places and that's why we have to make a swap of the technologies for each product for each company yeah so it's always it would be always of synergy of different different technologies that's why blockchain is not a uh, competitive stuff it is always when everyone helps each other and uh, and yeah we are, we are we are making one goal only it's like a dao we are we are trying to make a truth in a data truth in its transactions so it doesn't ma uh, matter who actually is a leader the market is so small we don't need to to, to cut pieces from it. We have to make a one big thing, thing really huge, and there we will get our own pieces and we'll be a lot of already. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of projects uh, expanding off into different uh, ways and, and nobody's figured out any all of it yet. Um, is this a radical experimentation going on? Um, Joshua, our two other panelists commented a lot. Would you like to jump in and reflect on their thoughts? Yeah, sure. So. <clears throat> Uh, you know, I've, I've worked on some uh, DAFs on supply chain management, uh, health records, and uh, and uh, copyright re registration of blockchain. Uh, certain certain uh, industries really do require uh, security and privacy. And if you're an incumbent big organization, um, if I were running that organization, I would stick with the major corporations that are um, kind of uh, that I've already worked with, uh, especially when I need speed and privacy. Now, if I'm doing something in, in banking, uh, you know, really what you need is just a consortium. So something like Hyperledger or uh, some of these other systems are totally appropriate. Uh, I probably, if I was a bank, I probably would not be using um, a public uh, blockchain. Um, and I'd probably be looking for something that I can configure uh, with my other uh, members in the consortium. Now, that said, uh, public blockchains are absolutely going to be around and they're a social utility and they're good for the world. And uh, they'll also provide opportunities for uh, developers on kind of niche projects to have an opportunity to uh, to really uh, reach a wider audience and, and provide strong, like very strong levels of trust. Um, and I, I think the the future regarding public and uh, private blockchains are you're going to have both. I think that uh, the upcoming uh, next generation uh, bl uh, blockchains will have uh, public chain, but also be able to have permission chains uh, just built into it, kind of like what you guys were mentioning. I want to jump back um, to Henry. So he was talking about different platforms. And I know that, I guess, from my understanding, Joshua, your platform is kind of like an open, anybody can build on it, anybody can do anything platform, yes? So we're still in kind of stealth mode. But mm -hmm. the answer is, it'll be a public blockchain. Mm -hmm. But it will also enable permission blockchains configurable okay. to uh, whatever settings you need. And I think that, um, Jan, your blockchain is, 
kind of a specific driven purpose blockchain, like you have a certain vertical or a certain market that you're going after, which is verification of data, yes? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. And we, we, also, we also, so when we went to the government organizations, we asked them, okay, can you, do you wanna implement our solution inside your organization? And they, the first question was, and who will get this data? Where mm. will be this data stored? Mm. Will be stored in the US or in China or where? And, uh, and I understood everything with this question. Mm. So we, our solution, we offer big organizations and companies to deploy their own private blockchain. They can store all the private data of their users on their site, and they can promise to everyone, don't worry, all your data is secured because it's in our hands. Mm. And after they verify it with the public blockchain, Mm. and it's no personal data there, and they can transfer data from one organization to another one via our blockchain protocol, mm. as they can make preferences which amount of data or which amount of tokens do they want to change, mm. and uh, yeah, a lot of different, different, different options. Okay. Henry, you had something you wanted to say? Yeah, well, I think, I think uh, Jan just made a very good point. Um, you know, you asked a question about scalability. Uh, how, do you, how, do, how do blockchain scale? And there's a lot of discussions about Layer one scalability solutions, layer two scalability solutions, Lightning Network, Rain, uh, Rains, Plasma, uh, Segwit. Um, there are a lot of discussions about it, but at the end of the day, we are not sure like which one is the best way to scale a blockchain. But I think what I personally very much uh, like where Plasma is coming from, uh, specifically in the in uh, specifically related to their approach, saying that you know. You know, you, your business might not be suitable to use a Ethereum public blockchains, uh, but then you could use your own, you could create your own private blockchains uh, with your own standards, with your own governance structure, and with whatever consensus model that you want to build. But simply uh, use Plasma to validate the transactions on a public Ethereum network. That way, your private blockchains can have so much more validity, so much more legitimacy, because you're, you're not acting as a centralized authority, uh, having ownership of and control over these transactions and data. But then you're openly validating whatever transactions happening on your private chains to be validated to the public blockchains. And I think that approach uh, will make a lot of difference in uh, moving forward. Uh, work, uh, how, do we, how do public blockchains work with private blockchains? It's not to force them to use a public blockchain. It's allowing them and creating a mechanism that these private blockchain, blockchains can somehow uh, be exposed to the innovations that we're trying to accomplish in a public blockchain side, which is bringing more transparency, uh, bringing more uh, immutable nature of blockchain uh, technologies. Those uh, type of concept is very new to this world, and I think those different concepts, uh, I think private companies can really benefit if they get exposed to and embrace those concepts. So that I just wanted to kind of follow back on Jan's comment. And do you think, that's good thoughts, do you think ICON will be working more in the future with private blockchains or public blockchains or you don't care, or don't know? What do you think we're going to go down that route? Yeah, since the topic of this uh, panel is the future of protocols, I one, I don't want to talk too much about ICON specifics, <laughs> but I think what ICON is trying to do is at this stage, uh, because we started as a private uh, blockchain company, we have ex a lot of existing uh, relationship and uh, partnership in the private block private with the private companies. But right now, our most focus is building uh, and secure securely building and enhancing the mainnet itself. So uh, for the short term being, I think it has to be in, in parallel. It has to be two track approach. But then right now, uh, our, foot, our, our weight is more on building the public blockchain at this point. All right, so then uh, you made a good point. Let's, let's bring it really, really, really general. Um, uh, I wanna give an example with NIM. Um, when NIM started in January of 2014, the developers made a test net and uh, they wrote a blockchain from scratch. They thought it wasn't very good. They threw it away. Then they made another blockchain from scratch. They thought it was much better. And that's the one that went on to be launched that we call NIM. Then a few months after, maybe six months after launch, uh, the NIM developers started to think we could do this better even again and they started to make another blockchain from scratch. That was open sourced one month ago with Catapult. And so what we've seen in NIM is a kind of like 
Windows 3.1, Windows 95, Windows 2000, Windows XP. And I don't know really of any other um, protocol that's done that. Like Bitcoin has just always been Bitcoin. And it's working really well to do what it was designed, which is in Bitcoin. Um, but I'm wondering if your thoughts, do you see constantly new protocols coming out or do you see protocols going through major updates or how do you see that happening? Like the Bitcoin model, the Ethereum model, incremental improvements or every once in a while this protocol just needs to be thrown away and we start over from scratch. Maybe I'll just... Yeah, yeah. Anybody, anybody can jump in. Yeah, I think that... Uh, I think that, uh, yeah, when we developed our blockchain protocol, we also changed several times and started from scratch. Actually, we started from uh, for forging Graffini at the, at the beginning, and uh, we thought that, yeah, Graffini is a nice technology and everything is cool, but later we moved to another one and then we started from scratch. Yeah, so technology is, you know, it is developing so fast right now and even in the in the blockchain industry it's much much more faster and uh, it means that what is popular right now and is what is good right now it wouldn't be as good in like a year or half a year so i'm i'm more about making a platform which can be a hub to different 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 blockchains so it had to be very flexible so that i can adopt to any new technologies which can appear in a months a year half a year yeah so i have I, my my point is now for creating a very flexible hub where i can connect different different solutions that's my i think that key key features which i which i uh, which i have in, in my in, in my in, in my head is that i have to be always friendly to all the all the solutions so it would be one of the main uh, opportunities to become a, a big one yeah yeah i think uh the, it's really important to be willing and able to recreate yourself. Uh, let's think about blockchain technology. This is supposed to be an immutable ledger that, frankly, is supposed to exist forever. So how are we supposed to predict technology that's going to emerge next year, 10 years from now, 100 years from now? So part of like our mission statement for Unity Chain is to uh, simulate the best techniques as they emerge. Now, we cannot always predict what they're going to be. That's why I think it's really important for blockchains and uh, ecosystems to have a governance structure. Uh, so you can actually make these system upgrades without too much friction to have it a democratic approach. Um, but certainly, I think it's very important to be willing and able to recreate yourself as new technologies emerge. I just have to say that you, you, your engineers are very brave because it's really hard to admit that what you've done up to this point is not good and then you could do something better and then start off from scratch. Uh, for, in the blockchain industry, it's really hard to kind of, uh, you see a lot of maximalists, and I think Jeff and I agree uh, that it's, that's mm -hmm. a not, a, not, a, not a good way, not, not a good walk, uh, road to walk, mm -hmm. being a maximalist in this industry, because... A maximalist is basically a person that thinks only their blockchain is the best, and everything else is never going to survive. So, yeah, I, I'm definitely, we're definitely not maximalist. We think that there's a big world with a lot of protocols, and different protocols are going to get different adoptions in different places. And there, I, I personally have a lot of projects that I like and a lot of protocols that I like. Yeah, so I think uh, at some point in this industry, we're still very early, and I agree with Jan's point that is, you know, we're competing for market growth, not competing for market share at this point. But at certain stage of this industry, there will be a point where consolidation will happen. Uh, but then I, I don't see it in a way that there will be a single protocol that everything is built on top of, whether, it'll be, uh, whether that will be achieved through a layer one scalability solutions or a layer two scalability solutions or whatever. I think there will be a multiple blockchains with multiple value propositions. Um, and I think that's having that, mental, having that mentality and having that concept in mind is very important to survive in this industry and move forward in this industry. So, uh, you know, cheers to the NEM engineers who admitted that they've, what they've done so far, you know, they could do something better and, and now they've built a much better and much enhanced version of a NEM mainnet. So, I, I think it's that, that type of mentality of accepting someone else's technology is better. Uh, is very important for this industry. And given that this is an open source industry, 
open source development environment, uh, you know, the engineers within this industry needs to accept that someone else could be a better. To be clear, NIM is not bad. It's good. They just wanted to make something great. <laughs> it never broke. There was never any problems with it. It always worked since day one. Uh, it was always good. It just wasn't everything, they, th they imagined a better thing. But I want to go back and kind of clarify for the audience really quick some of our terminology. You're talking about layer one and layer two, and uh, market share and market growth. And so let me break those down for our audience really quickly. Layer one is basically when we think of Bitcoin. And Bitcoin has run into some scalability problems because it can only do so many transactions per second. And then so the Bitcoin developers, instead of kind of taking the approach to throw it away and start a new Bitcoin, they're trying to make a layer two. Now that's called the Lightning Network. And it holds incredible promise for the Bitcoin network. If Lightning can add extra transactions and drop transaction fees, that'll be an absolutely wonderful thing. But when we talk about market share and market growth, basically, no blockchain really has a significant market share, even Bitcoin. So basically we have all these different projects and they're all looking to grow and to grow and to grow. And there's a lot of room left to grow with all of these markets. And none of them has a market share that is really something that we could consider. If you take Bitcoin, for instance, just Seoul Station, Seoul Yuck in, in Seoul, does more transactions per second than Bitcoin. <laughs> so if you tried to put the whole, uh, every beep just for Soul Station on Bitcoin, it would break it. And Bitcoin has been working, it's been working for what it is, but it doesn't have a solid market share. In fact, none of the blockchains have a solid market share and we're all growing. So I just wanted to clarify those, market share, market growth, and layer one and layer two. And they're, they're very different approaches. I wanna clarify too, when we think of layer one and layer two, I, I try to think of it as in America a long time ago, there was something where we had like gold. And gold was money a long time ago. But the problem with gold is that it's heavy to put it in your pocket. It's difficult to break apart. Um, you know, it's a little bit painful. It's hard to whatever. So carrying large amounts of gold was difficult. So the solution for gold was that you put your gold in a bank and the bank gave you an IOU. Now the IOUs were very light. They were very easy and you could spend those IOUs and other people could make smaller IOUs or bigger IOUs, and the IOUs from a bank was way better. Now, eventually, governments started making IOUs with gold, and that became money. You could take dollar bills into a bank, and they would give you gold. Eventually, there's no gold anymore. But when we think of like a layer two, this is kind of what the Lightning Network does on Bitcoin. You take Bitcoin, which is like the gold of money, it's heavy, it's a little bit hard to send, it's expensive to transport, but then you build a layer two on top of it, like Lightning Network, which is fast and easy and cheap. And if Bitcoin's able to do this, it'll be a wonderful thing for Bitcoin. But when we look at Bitcoin, Bitcoin is mainly just a protocol that wants to do money. There were early on a lot of projects that wanted to um, build lots of currencies or identification or special projects on top of Bitcoin, and most of those projects have now failed. And they failed because Bitcoin was designed for one thing, which is sending Bitcoin. So then I wanna go back and ask our panelists, what do we think about protocols in the future? Do we need specialized protocols that do just one thing and does it well, or do we want to look at protocols like Ethereum or NIM that allow a wide variety of applications to be built? Yeah, I want to add for the previous question also, not a question, I want to add for your stuff. So I, I, I have a off topic, I have a friend who has a company, he produced hats with the ears, with the funny ears. Mm -hmm. And he did, he did, he does well, he earned a lot of money. 
And once he said, like, okay, now I have to think about a new business idea. And he was thinking about a week and then he made it. I will produce hats without ears. I said, hey, nice idea. And uh, so that's the same with the blockchain. Everyone says, that, okay, we need to use a blockchain everywhere where you can even, even uh, ever, ever try to do. To do. And uh, blockchain technology becomes very overpopulated, uh, overpopular. So it is, uh, sometimes it's better not to use a blockchain at all. For example, some companies, small companies, they don't need to make a huge infrastructure blockchain and put it in different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they can use a Google Drive and make a verification of it, and it would be already a good point. And uh, so that's why we can and have to provide everyone to use as a blockchain solutions and also not a blockchain solution, just tell everyone that here's this data is verified on the blockchain, this one is not so on the blockchain, but still you can trust it. And uh, sometimes there were some, some guys uh, say that blockchain is a database. And I think that, uh, and I know that experts also think that blockchain is not a database. Blockchain is a blockchain. And uh, if a blockchain is a database, it's, ex it's expensive, it's uh, slow, it's difficult to implement. Yeah, so blockchain has its own solution for verifying some data. And it can be verifying data inside the blockchain or it can verify another blockchain as uh, NEM does, for example, as verifying a uh, MongoDB database. Mm. Yeah, so we can verify pictures or we can verify different databases or texts or websites, whatever you want. Uh, so it means that there is no um, difference between using a special uh, blockchains as, for example, Ripple or like a flexible one, like as a, like a Serum or M. So uh, it means that you have to use it in a correct way, is the first thing. And not everything is about blockchain. So you have to always keep an eye on what actually you need, which technology in which situation. So, and flexible of different technologies will, will rule, will rule all, the, all the industry. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So, I think layer one solutions, uh, like for example, with Unity Chain, we're building a new consensus protocol. I think consensus protocols should be, uh, uh, should be available to run multiple, very flexible, basically. Um, but I think specific application layer protocols like that do something specific, like say copyright re registration or uh, supply chain management, um, I think those protocols should be very specific to a specific task and be the best at that one thing. Since we're focusing on the base layer, the foundational layer, a brand new consensus um, algorithm, uh, we are intending to be uh, kind of pretty much open to run anything on uh, as a foundation. Okay. Go ahead. Go yeah, ahead. Just, a sh just a short comment on your question. I think, you know, this is a very good question. Um, you know, I don't have a clear answer to it, but what I can say is, uh, right now, a lot of the a lot of the testing, so called, is happening on a general purpose on top of a general purpose uh, blockchain networks, mm -hmm. and and that is completely fine. And these uh, specific purpose blockchain protocols, although they may bring a lot of values in the future, it, there will be you know it will be very hard to actually bring bring in uh, a real value because what we already have what we what we have in Seoul is is pretty good. It's pretty good. It's it's very hard to do better at certain things. Uh, than what we have done before. So if, 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 if certain applications, if certain protocols to focus on certain industry verticals and do really well in, the, in, in, in that particular verticals, it will be you know, very innovational, it will be life-changing. But what we have is very good, so it's very, it will be very hard to completely change certain verticals or certain industry. Uh, but I do, I do have a strong support for those projects. But so I think right now, as I said, we're very early in this industry and a lot of testing needs to be done. And the testing, I think the better way to test things uh, are on top of a more of a general purpose vehicles, uh, which are like uh, the, the public chains that you mentioned. Thanks, Henry. Um, so I want to change the topic a little bit uh, and tell a story. Today, I was watching a YouTube video with a professor from India, a very smart professor. And he was doing an interview, and he said, I don't believe in Bitcoin. I don't believe in Bitcoin. And there's probably some people in the audience that maybe don't believe in Bitcoin too, right? 
Uh, but I want to be kind of clarify this. When we say, I don't believe in Bitcoin, that's not true. Every person here in this audience believes in Bitcoin as in to say we believe that it's real. When you say, I don't believe in aliens, you mean aliens don't exist, or I don't believe in God. God doesn't exist. But everybody in this room knows that Bitcoin exists. There was a time, a long time ago, when I told people, hey, there's something called NIM, it's money, we made it, and they said, I don't believe that, I don't believe you, you're a liar, <laughs> right? And now everybody believes that something called NIM exists. So when people say, I don't believe in Bitcoin, what they're really saying is, I don't believe it will work. I don't believe it will work. And that's because they don't believe in the protocol, right? They think the protocol is not good. And to be fair, as I mentioned earlier, no protocol has really gained mass adoption. So I want to ask our panel members, when do we think people are going to say, I believe in blockchain, and not, I believe blockchain will be good someday, but I believe blockchain is here now, I believe in blockchain, it's changing the world. When do we get to hear this, people say that? Right, uh, good question, good question. Uh, I think, uh, you know, all, whenever a certain technology is introduced uh, and used and utilized by individuals, usually, um, the technology, once, once it is introduced, it kind of builds on, 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 on improving the technology. And at some point, it kind of tips. And then, and then that, from that point on, the technology starts to bring in values to the individuals. Uh, but for blockchains, uh, the technology is just starting. And it's starting to build and starting to get tractions. But because of this unique nature or unique concept of tokens or tokenized assets, that it, it to certain ex, to certain extent it already brought in value to the users that who will be using the, uh, on top of this technology. So I think one, it is very important to manage your expectations. Uh, just because you made a twenty x on an ICO doesn't mean the technology is ready. A lot of the projects uh, in this industry is pre-product, uh, meaning there's no product to be used by users. Uh, a second point that I want to mention is that the projects. Uh, the, the industry leaders uh, need to t think about what problems are we really trying to solve? Because uh, this is very common in, in a very uh, high-tech industry, but people build things without thinking about whether this is something that will be used by people. So for example, Concorde, uh, it's a mock flying airplane, and it was a state-of-the-art technology but then if you think about the price of making it, price of riding on a Concorde, it just doesn't make sense. You don't need to fly from point A to point B in 30 minutes where you could buy cheap tickets to fly, fly to point B in two hours, let's say. So uh, it's very important for people like myself, people like Jeff, Jan, and Joshua to try to think about whether what I'm doing right now is something that people really need. We all talk about innovations, technologies, but is, do, do people really need a instantaneous transparent transactions where they could you know, swipe their credit cards and get whatever they want? It's, it's, it's important, one, for you, you all to think about how the paradigm is shifting, but at the same time, give feedbacks to us about you know, what you guys really need, you know, rather than us trying to push the new technologies into your everyday lives. So I think those two points are very important uh, things to think about uh, for both of us, I think. And Jan? Yeah. I think that for 90% of people, or maybe 99% of people, blockchain is a black box, and no one understands what, what happens inside. Is it a database, or is it a blockchain, or is it a node? What, what, what is it inside? I think that when huge companies for example, b big brand companies, uh, for example, I don't know, Hermes, for example, if they come and say that, okay, guys, we have $6 billion annual turnover and $1.2 billion a year uh, profits, and we implemented our blockchain solution inside, and now we have $6 billion of uh, turnover and $2.2 billion of profits, it works, and it makes already value, and it is only just because of this blockchain protocol. 
And uh, I think that that message would be much more uh, clear for these 99% of people. So it's better to go to the industry, it's better to go to the big, huge, well-known companies, show them what you actually did, make a pilot versions of your software, and uh, they, even for free, they can make it implemented for free, try it, make their profits, and then if one company from the industry tried it, later different companies from the same uh, sector also will adopt this, this technology. And there you can get your profits and uh, make uh, your technology more valuable. And yeah, it's the main thing. Because your tokens can be bought by guys who wants to speculate. It's one thing. But it's much more powerful when someone is buying your token for using it. Because it means that some way there you are will growing, growing, growing. And it will be, uh, it will, it will, it will be a long story. And then more investors will come to your project, more business developers will come. And you actually can create a company which will integrate to the different uh, types of uh, industry. Not just a one year ICO project which is like a launch and then disappear and burn somewhere else. Yeah, so it's, it's everything is about real world and how you will implement this software to the real world and how will you make profits for them and how you make an extra value for each company and for each people which you integrate with. Okay, thank you, and Joshua? Yeah, so uh, I actually I have very similar thoughts to that. Uh, I think that once corporations implement blockchain, you wait one year and if they have extreme efficiency and, and profit gains, then you're gonna start to see other corporations adopting it, they're gonna be racing towards it and it'll trickle down to the masses. Masses should, over time, probably experience, let's just talk about, like, say, health, uh, health insurance. They should probably start to see um, some reduction in some of their premiums because uh, basically the whole point of uh, blockchains and smart contracts is to improve and increase efficiency. So I would say one year after successfully implementing um, a blockchain solution, uh, just look at the P&L, and that's when people start to uh, really take notice. Okay, well, thank you. And I'd like to thank our panelists for coming up here today, and we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. All right, thank you, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff.